I'm very pleased to introduce the Dean of the School of Information, Annalise Sextinian, who will introduce our final uh, and closing keynote speaker, Stephen Adler from IBM, IBM's information strategist. So please join me in welcoming Dean Sextinian. Well, I'm especially honored to be able to introduce Stephen Adler. As Camille said, Stephen is IBM's information strategist. And I'm going to put a little asterisk on that and a footnote and come back to it. Um, but I'm going to go on uh, introducing him. He's responsible for IBM's information strategy, including data governance, big data, open data, and system dynamics. Uh, he developed and leads the information governance community is chair of the IBM Information Strategy Council and advises customers on information strategy and governance around the world. Um, but that's not all. I want to give you a bit of a picture of where he comes from. I can't believe he's as young as he is when I uh, was preparing this. I, th I thought I was going to be introducing a gray hair. Um, <laughs> um, but listen to this. Listen to this. From his LinkedIn profile, he says, I like to build products and markets, turn around organizations, and jumpstart growth. And you know what? That's what he's done. In 1996, Stephen invented internet insurance, persuading leading underwriters to understand the internet as an area of exposure that required insurance coverage to grow into the commercial marketplace it is today. Uh, in 2001, Stephen patented the enterprise privacy architecture and led a team that translated the first legal regulations into XML. These are huge achievements. In 2004, he founded IBM's Data Governance Council a thought leadership forum of 50 companies that created the data governance industry uh, through collaborative IP development and benchmarking. In 2009, he hosted meetings in New York's systematic risk taxonomies and made recommendations for systemic risk councils that are today part of financial regulatory reform in the US and the EU. In 2010, he created the Information Governance Community, a social networking leadership growth with 3,000 members worldwide. That's a pretty long, impressive list of achievements for somebody this young. Uh, now I want to go back to my asterisk and, uh, and also a very fitting, I have to say, background for this entire conference. Um, but I want to go back to what is an information strategist? It's not one of those job titles that you see very often. Uh, here's what he says in a blog post from 2013. He says, I'm an information strategist. My job title is new, but my challenge is ancient. I have to get the right information to the right people at the right time. If the information is the wrong format, or if it's hard to read, confusing or conflicting with sloppy interfaces, then I have failed. Endless lists and search results without relationships, connections, and meaning are not what my customers demand. They want clarity, and they expect interfaces to match the ease of use they are accustomed to on their tablets and smartphones. It sounds like a motto for the School of Information. And then he concludes, information strategists combine data management, information governance, and data science techniques to deliver refined, fit-for-purpose, high-value information products and services across the entire information supply chain. I think you're going to see more of information strategists in the coming decades. And with that, I want to turn it over to Stephen. Uh, he's the best person to see. Well, thank you. We're good? Well, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. I'm normally, I think I told you before your introduction that I'm normally embarrassed by these introductions, but that was so beautifully done. And thank you um, for this fantastic conference today. I, I have to say that this has been one of the most interesting conferences I've been to in a long time. And the speakers have been excellent today. And the content has been really thought provoking. And I've really enjoyed it. I wanted to share with you today a little bit about I thought about putting together a chart deck that talked a little bit about some of the questions that many of you posed during the conference that we're thinking about at IBM that you might like to know is actually being looked at, that your concerns and your issues about open data and what it means, people are actually working on. But rather than go through 30 charts at the end of the day, between now and the refreshments, which are waiting outside, I think I'm going to go through a few but then I'd like to open it up. I'd like to have a little dialogue, because I have a feeling that all of us want to communicate together. I heard Gavin Newsom today talk about how open data is a bi-directional conversation, yet all I saw throughout the conversation today was a monologue from the, 
from, from up here out to you. So perhaps we can change that at the end of the day and talk a little bit about what we've learned together and maybe learn a little bit from each other. Okay? Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. So first, uh, you know, a little bit of IBM advertising. You may not know, but actually we are in the open data space. I'm out here to tell you today. I've come from New York out to California. IBM actually does do open data too, if you hadn't heard. We started work years ago on smarter cities. Have you seen the commercials? Okay, I don't have to go into that then. Good. Uh, you know, we've been doing smarter cities challenges. Are you familiar with those? We take five or six IBMers from across, it's a kind of a tradition at IBM. For decades now, we have done collaborative cross-organizational projects where we take different people from different parts of the company and we fly them out, sometimes to Almaden, California, where we have research lab. I've done two projects like that out here. We take them from all across the company and we put them into a place to work on a project that has nothing to do with what they do, normally do in their day jobs. And we lifted that internal model, and we've applied it now to city strategy. And in the last three years, we've taken over 500 IBMers who have worked pro bono for these cities, and we've put them into over 100 cities to help develop smarter city strategies for these cities all around the world. Lots of them in the United States, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, everywhere. It's kind of an outside-in design model, you might say, of bringing innovation to the far corners of the world to help different cities transform themselves, to develop new traffic management strategies, healthcare, open data, lots of different solutions. We're also looking very carefully at the open data environment and the ecosystem. We're beginning to understand that there are some critical questions that we need to start to answer about how we provide high-quality, trusted information to cities that publish it out to populations who use it. And so we're beginning to think about what type of architecture do we need to provide for cities to actually deliver information where they know where it came from, they know how they derived it, they know whether they trust it before they give it to us, they know what it should be used for, they know how it's used, they can measure the impact on society, on the different stakeholders. We're beginning to think about, well, open data, it's this fascinating early adopter movement that is developing really powerful and important cultures of transformation. It's transforming city administration. It's transforming IT departments. It's transforming civic engagement. Well, how do we make sure that that transformation is sustainable, that it lasts, that it lives up to the expectations of all the stakeholders involved? So we're beginning to think about what type of architectures do we need to maintain that type of sustainability? We're also internalizing what we are seeing in the marketplace and using that ourselves. So inside of IBM, we're running hackathons. We're a large company, 400 and, I don't know, 30,000 employees worldwide. It's not the type of institution that you would think about when you say the word hackathon. <laughs> I have to tell you a story that I came out here to California to go to my first hackathon at Code of America. It was about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I went to a hackathon on, uh, what was it, at their offices in San Francisco on publishing the San Francisco City Code in XML. And I saw this amazing environment with 30 or 40 developers, you know, sitting on sofas, working on code, developing in Ruby and Python and Perl, using JSON, using amazing technologies that allow really rapid prototyping. And I was so excited by what I saw because you just don't see that often in the enterprise world. I work with banks, I work with insurance companies, I work with telecommunications carriers, I even work with governments in other parts of the world, and I had never heard of a hackathon before. And so I, it, what, the next week after the hackathon, I was visiting with the chief data officer for lunch for a large bank, and you know, we were talking about enterprise data governance and metadata and all kinds of things, and I told her, you know, I was just at a hackathon, and she said, what? Hack a what? I said, yeah, hackathon. Have you ever heard of that? She said, no. You know, hackathon doesn't sound like something that I would go to. Thank you. <laughs> and I told her, well, it's this really fascinating thing. These people get together. They're not being paid. They show up late at night after a long, stressful day at the office. 
they contribute their time and their energy and their imagination to developing code for free. And they use these new cool languages like Ruby on Rails and Perl and Python and JavaScript. And they actually develop code snippets in three hours to use data to develop really cool innovative interfaces. And she sat there looking at me like I was from Mars. You know, this is just not permeated inside the enterprise yet. And I said to her, but you know what's really cool about this is that these cities are using this external resource to transform themselves. This is about enterprise transformation. They're going outside to free development resources. Through, it's a town hall. You know, it's all it really is. It's a civic town hall like politicians have been doing for years, except the population of developers. And they're giving free resource to the city, which is great. It's like a political win. It's an IT win. Everyone wins. And all IT does is have to publish the data. Now, you know, in the enterprise, this is a radical idea because the enterprise is like a factory. We have built enterprise IT like an industrial automation plant. We, we, we source the raw materials. We manufacture semi-finished products. And we deliver reports to business, yet IT has no idea what is going to be done with that data after it gets... We don't even know how the reports are used. We just we collect requirements. We think we understand. We hire business analysts. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, out of the, the last place on earth enterprise IT expects to find innovation, public sector, produces this remarkable model of innovation-driven transformation in which you have developers working for free, developing interfaces to data, and IT no longer has to worry about how the data is going to be used. And she looked at me and she said, wow, that's really powerful. I could do so much with that. I wouldn't have to actually get my IT people to figure out what to do with the data anymore. They just publish it. And then, well, I said to her, do you think you have enough developers in business who would actually be able to develop interfaces for that. So instead of publishing data to your customers, maybe think about your line of business people as your customers. Would that work? She said, hell yeah. I mean, every day, everybody graduating today with an MBA knows how to develop in Perl and Python and Ruby. And you can go to business schools around the world, not just in the United States and Denmark and France and, and Singapore, and you find young Gen X, Gen Y people graduating today with an MBA who know how to code because they're developing websites for their friends as part-time jobs. And these are the people who are matriculating into companies today. They're assuming leadership positions. These people can be developing applications inside of an organization, and we can let IT stop being the one-stop factory. Instead, just publish the data. It's a radical. I mean, I have to tell you, this thing that you guys have done in, in public sector is transformational. I think it's going to be a, a revolution, not just in public sector, but across private sector organizations, too. It's a fascinating development that it came out of this culture you've developed. Now, we're also, like you, beginning to realize that all of this stuff that's going on needs some standards. So back in August, we decided to support a fledgling standards initiative at W3C. Do you guys know what W3C is? Who knows what W3C is? Good. World Wide Web Consortium. They created the standard at standards for the internet. HTML, CSS, all the stuff. World Wide Web Consortium. OWL, RDF. They're creating an open data best practices working group to create vocabularies for data interoperability in open data. And I am supporting it as a co-chair. And this will hopefully be announced sometime in September. I'm just sharing it with you now. And um, yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, are you going to be working with Oasis since they are the standards body that's largely being driven by data for enterprises? Well, I'm actually co-chair of another working group at Oasis, <laughs> but not on open data, on system dynamics. But yes, of course, we work with Oasis as well. Um, and why do we need these standards? Well, here's uh, something that we did at IBM. Do you guys know City Forward? Has anybody ever heard of this? 
That's why I'm here, to tell you guys. <laughs> City Forward is um, it's a website that was set up by IBM Foundation. We have a foundation that does public things like this. It's an aggregation of open data from 120 different cities around the world. We've been doing it for the last four years, publishing open data through this portal. If you want to do comparative analytics on city populations, on pollution, on a variety of different factors, you can go to cityforward.org and you can see how we collect data from different sources. I would like to say that it's easy to do, but it's not. <laughs> it's very difficult. Cities don't make it easy to do comparative analytics. Uh, pollution data from Hamburg is not the same as pollution data from Palo Alto. It might look the same, it might come in a table that looks like it's normalized for each other, but we don't really know how the data is calculated, how it's normalized, how it's prepared, what its derivation is. We don't have the lineage of where it came from. We don't have any metadata that describes it. That we don't even know its frequency for update. Oftentimes we have vastly different frequency scales of updates from different cities from around the world. Some cities publish data on a daily basis, some cities do it on a monthly basis, some cities do it on a quarterly basis. It makes it very difficult to compare and do comparative analytics on information that really has no standard, and that's why we're doing the standards initiative. Now, what if we could have open standards, and what if we could do comparative analytics? Then the story I'm about to tell you probably wouldn't have been as bad as it was. Now, I told you earlier that I am from New York, and last year in New York, we had a big storm. Right, is anybody else here from New York? Did anybody else live through Hurricane Sandy? Yeah, I did. Three weeks without power. When you live for three weeks without power, you learn why people in the Middle Ages had such short lives. Because it's extremely stressful to have to figure out how to heat your home every day with wood that you have to gather from the street because the stores are sold out. I lived through Hurricane Sandy, three weeks, no power. When this storm hit, nobody was prepared. All of us expected it to be similar to Hurricane Irene the year before, just a blowover that might really damage New Jersey but leave us on Long Island totally alone. <laughs> that was not the case. It was a large, you know the whole story, I don't have to tell you anymore. Largest storm in history, we had blackouts throughout the region, parts of, this, parts of the area. I live on the north shore of Long Island, where, where I live on a relatively high area, elevated-wise. Not so high as like here, but, you know, a couple hundred feet above sea level. My street wasn't flooded, per se, but the south shore of Long Island was a complete disaster. These are pictures that I took as I wandered on the third day after the storm through Long Beach, and I saw levels of devastation I'd never seen in my life. Long Beach was, uh, looked like a war zone. There were Humvees patrolling the streets of the National Guard. There were Black Hawk helicopters flying overhead. My wife and I met some kids. This is a picture I took of Long Beach, the devastation that we had. We met some kids on the street, and the first question they asked us were, are you looters? Because they had been broken into so many times, they expected anybody they met to want to rob their home. And even one month later, this is one month later, we still had large amounts of Long Island, 200,000 people without any power. We only learned after the storm that Lilco, our local power authority, only had 50 uh, utility poles in their inventory for the entire town, for the entire uh, of Long Island. There are 3 million people who live on Long Island. 50 utility poles is like nothing. In my town alone, I live in a small town of 15,000 people, every one of our substations blew. We had no power, three weeks. And what was the damage estimate? 110 deaths, $62 billion in losses. Of course, that's the congressional estimate. That's what the New York delegation put together. We don't really know what it was. But the question that I, I as I said earlier, I, I work with system dynamics, I work with data governance, and so the question that came to my mind during the crisis was, hey, didn't we develop models that could predict this? Where, where, where were all those models? Don't politicians always bring out these amazing models they have? Where were these models? And it turns out there were dozens of really accurate predictive models that predicted various aspects of this storm. The sad part was nobody knew where they were and nobody was using them. And the best predictive models are not really very effective if nobody uses them or nobody knows how to use them. And this is a real challenge 
you know, it isn't just that, the, that they didn't have the models, it's that different towns developed their own models and didn't share their models with other towns. So we have a lack of regional planning that occurs. Um, you only learn about these things after the crisis is over when everything becomes revealed. Towns, town, local town governments don't often talk to each other. You know, there isn't like a huge collaboration going on between like Port Washington where I live and Great Neck, the next town over, in terms of planning for things like crises like this that happen. So I wanted to not only complain about this, because I did, of course, complain vociferously about these issues. Well, as I lived through them, my wife complained to me, I complained to the town, you know how it goes. I thought it'd be interesting if I could provide you with a vision of how it should have been. Now, I can only provide you a fictional vision of how it should have been because I know this is New York and this will never happen the way it should happen. So let me give you an idea. What should have happened is we should have had a tri-state simulation center where weather simulations, supply chain simulations, electricity simulations, a whole variety of different, different types of simulations could have been used three, a week before the storm hit to predict what likely scenarios could occur if storms of various magnitudes hit the region and how the populations might be affected and what people should do to prevent the worst from happening. Like in my town, we had total supply chain disruption. After, two days after the storm, there was no food in the stores. There were no generators at Home Depot or Lowe's. There was no gasoline at the uh, gas stations. We had five-hour waits to pick up gas. All of this could have been modeled and imagined. We could have estimated the flooding and tree damage. We could have estimated the impact on hospitals. We could have estimated the impact on elderly. We could have estimated the impact on people who don't have smartphones or internet connections and can't communicate with IT. We could have done robocalls to the evacuation zone to find out how people are doing. My wife and I did walk-arounds through the community to talk to people who were in their homes, locked in their homes, terrified, because they had no electricity, they had no lights, they had no heat, and nobody from the city services ever came around to ask them, hey, how are you doing? You know, old people sitting in their homes, terrified to come outside. Nobody bothered to ch check up on them. We might have simulations measuring the impact on the oil and gas supply chain so that people could still drive around without having to wait online. And we might be able to assess tree damage to a plan how much equipment we'll need in the zone itself when the crisis hits. And we might actually monitor big, uh, use big data feeds to monitor social media. Social media was alive and buzzing with information during Hurricane Sandy, yet it didn't seem like anybody was paying attention to it. People were talking about how much flooding they had, whether their basement was flooded, if they had to put their all their belongings on the street, they were talking about their gas lines. There was so much information that the population was providing that wasn't being picked up by administration. There are a lot of simulations that are developed these days, but none of them use open data. None of them are being used uh, by um, planners. But let me tell you about a simulation that we did build um, recently in 2011. Have you heard about this? This is a simulation we built for the city of Portland. It's a little different than emergency planning or crisis planning. It's a simulation we built using system dynamics and a company here in California named Forio, in which we modeled um, 13 of the city of Portland's different departments to show them how even the smallest policy changes in one part of the city have unintended tertiary consequences across the entire city. It's a fascinating pl policy planning tool which helps um, city planners understand that changes in um, transportation have an impact on citizen wellness. They have an impact on storefronts and grocery stores. They have an impact on health care. They even have an impact on carbon emissions and obesity. These were things that we all discovered by running this simulation. And here you can see this is an example of the policy tree we built, which shows city planners, if I change one policy, what other policies does it impact? 
we look at this and we think, well, when we built this model, we built it with inferred values for different things like uh, pollution emissions or um, health care. We wonder, gee, what if we could transform this 2D model that we built into a three-dimensional urban planning system in which we could upload open data into a 3D model like a SimCity environment and allow cities to do what-if scenario planning on how impacts to the city would be, how things would be affected by changing different aspects of public policy. So we were, really, I'm only there? <laughs> Damn. Um, well, I only have five minutes left. Lights up. Who's got the lights? Can we put the lights on? Good. You know, that's the problem when you, you talk for a living. You, you like to talk and you talk too long. So rather than me continue talking, let me ask you guys, what did you guys learn today? What was the most important takeaway you had today? I was living in a hurricane. So. <laughs> <laughs> we prefer the earthquake. Or fires. Yeah. That it's not just um, making the data available, it's making sure that, it, that there are people who know how to get it, analyze it, and do something. Good idea. What else? The open data can be the open as a verb, and it's okay. Open as a verb. Yes, opening data. Are we opening the data or are we opening ourselves? What else? Yeah. Well, I see a lot of potential and a lot of great possibilities to revitalize our national economy through all these data set systems. But how do we educate the general public about understanding how to use this in a more comprehensive way across the spectrum? And that's what I'm interested in, and that's what I gave you earlier. Yeah, good point. How do we educate the public? What else? Diego. So there are still in all the panels recurrent questions about the sustainability of yeah once we open the data what then how do we make how do we create a bit of value out of that and that was a recurrent question right how do we create value good I thought one of the inspiring um, examples that came up at various times was pulling data from different sectors so justice plus health plus poverty and the layering of different data sets um, can be very dynamic and generative Good point. Good point. Others? Yeah. Um, that open data is a more like a tool toward an end. What's the end? Social causes, other factors. Uh-huh. Good. Good. Yeah. Simply making the data available is enough and the way you present it and uh, can make a big difference in terms of uh, the way people just Uh-huh. Good. Yeah. I want to just pile on what Tim said, which is it's not just a problem of understanding and opening data, but it's a political and organizational problem as well. If we're going to get these silos in government and organizations to talk to each other, yet political and sort of organizational and social work to do as well as technical work. Yeah, this is, I think, an interesting point. When, um, what was her name? Post? Uh, Carol. Carol Post, when she did her presentation, I asked her out in the hallway. How many of the departments in the New York City, New York has 70 different chartered <laughs> agencies across the government. You know, New York City is the second largest government in the United States after the federal government, 300,000 employees, three times the size of Palo Alto, um, that is in terms of population. And I asked how many of the departments within the city are using the data that it publishes outside? And she said, you know, that's a really good question. Actually, quite a few. And actually, we have, she said they have use cases in which the city is able to, to develop efficiencies now using its own open data that it couldn't use internally because nobody talked to each other beforehand. How many, how many cities do we have in the room? Let me ask two questions. One, how many of you as individuals, no data geeks can, can answer this, sorry. How many of you actually use open data on a regular basis? Only three or four or five? What else are you, what else are you guys doing? Um, 
And how many of you work in city organizations that actually use the open data that other departments within the city have published? Only Palo Alto? Which city are you from? Uh, well, I'm a council member. Uh, oh, great. And which city? Uh, San Francisco. And, and has your uses of open data had a transformative effect on your city administration? Has it changed? You know, are you able to get new efficiencies from using open data that's published by another department? Do you have any use cases around that? Yeah. That's a great example. You? Uh, I mean, we get data requests all the time, so those requests get routed to the specific departments, and then that spurs them to kind of look through the records and see if they have that data available. Um, we're, we're waiting an appointment of a chief data officer, which will put more teeth in that kind of legislation. So I don't want to put you guys on the spot. So Peter, Palo Alto, San Francisco, Oakland, are you guys sharing best practices and open data between each other? Are your cities working together on hey, we developed this app over here, or we developed this data curation process. Are you guys sharing at all? Well, that Is will it... happen tomorrow. I think there was a delegation that went over to San Francisco that was kind of like Yeah, so there's different parties. I'm not the right person to be there. I'm you know, the only idiot. No. That's important. Yeah. You. There's some of that. Good. And Code for America creates, is creating kind of a community that talks to one another. How do you measure the impact of the data you're publishing on your stakeholders? Well, in our world, um, since I run the development services department, we manage all the building activity. And so the impact is satisfied by customers. So when my Council was getting positive feedback from developers, from residents, from applicants, that they're able to experience a process that's never been as efficient as it is now. That's good feedback. That's the kind of feedback we want to hear. You know, when we can uh, run analytics and see that our response times are lower, our turnaround times in the plan checks have dropped, that's all because there's a lot more communication across the silos between planning, building, public works, utilities, fire engineering, urban forestry, and all the other divisions and units that typically would work in a silo, but now because of technology, because of open data, are able to exactly see where everybody is in the process. Recently, we had an architect come to us and get a building permit in seven weeks to build a brand new home. That was unprecedented in, in the past, and it has a lot to do with the ability to share data quickly to make decisions. That's a great story. Great story. Let me ask you a question. Now that you know that IBM is involved in open data, this is not a, a, a commercial. What do you expect from large companies, large vendors like IBM in the open data world? What, I, I don't want to talk about what we can sell you or any of that stuff, but what value can we add in this ecosystem? I would say the, the ability to define the big picture in rigorous terms. If you have the resources to pull on this kind of experience that you have you know, around the world, and find the common denominators and create a sort of a scalable set of uh, issues and concerns that small cities like Palo Alto at 50,000, San Francisco at 750, or New York, whatever it is, 8 million, uh, that the, the problems faced by all these cities are pretty damn generic. They're scalable differences. But, uh, but there isn't any very, that's my knowledge anyway. I was very interested in what you didn't get to finish up there, because I read a little bit about the Portland. <coughs> Experience, but I think, and I, I've been here. This is my first experience at a group like this, and I'm, I'm an economist interested in, in cities and so on, and then their management. Uh, what's I, what I wasn't hearing here very much today was precisely what you were starting to get into, which is how to 
pull the pieces of the big picture together in a rather rigorous way that would suggest you know, future research and, and study. Agreed. Thank you. So I think one thing that I'd be interested to do is um, in Oakland, uh, the city council is going to consider adopting its open data policy on October 15th. We actually just scheduled it as a meeting this morning. And so I think that, open, that IBM should sponsor an open data race similar to what they talked about in Philadelphia and fund it and give us staff to support it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and would you do that, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to you. That's a great idea. No, but I mean, I thought that was a great model, and there's a moment in time where I think that would be a great thing for IBM to do. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback. Well, I, 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 I <laughs> <laughs> you want me to wrap up? Yeah, so I, I just put on the board a couple of things that, I, that occurred to me that I think we as a community want to think about. One thing I want to say to all of you is you're involved in a very, very important transformative movement, and I want to encourage everyone to keep at it. It's going to be, you know, these things have a bell curve of, of adoption and then revanchism, but what you're doing is really important. Uh, we think it's important, and you guys should feel really proud of the contribution you're making, not only to society, but as I said, I think that the things you're developing, the culture of this movement has important implications, not just in public sector, but across lots of other, other industries that are probably going to look at what you're doing here and saying, wow, that could really just change our entire organization. That makes so much sense. I wish we could just copy that, and a lot of people are going to want to come and learn from you. So I, I encourage you. I think you're doing a great job, and I really want to encourage this to continue. A few small things that occurred to me that you might want to think about. And these are more industry broadwise. One is, you know, when we do hackathons, we're intrinsically undermining the wage rates of developers around the world. <laughs> because when you provide something for free, the net present value of that thing that you're providing degrades. Not a lot, just a little bit over time. And so the, 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 it, it isn't just that you're providing it for free. It's that the developers are using tools which make it easy to do things faster and easier. And every time things get faster and easier, they also get cheaper. That's good for cities. It's not so good for developers. So that's something we ought to think about, and maybe we can have an economics discussion about that afterwards. Other thing is, when we publish data online, it might be public data when we publish it, that is, it might be that public paid for it already because we financed it through an IT department, they had a budget that was financed through taxes and the public gets it. But there's an implicit cost of producing it, and there's a cost of using it. And people will develop new models for recouping the cost of producing it and using it. And that's just a market fact. So somewhere along the line, we as consumers will end up having to pay for some of the information and its derivative works that get produced by all of you publishing all this data. That's just a market fact. So it won't always be free. There will be some costs in the future. We have some parts of open data that, gee, I don't think we're going to get. We, we probably have to worry, think about some parts like lapel cameras from law enforcement, they're probably going to resist publishing that information for a long time, aren't they? Um, the work you're doing, the journalists aren't going to like it either. Because what is a journalist today if they can't do primary analytics? On one level, the better journalists will learn to use more open data and the analytics themselves to produce better insights. On the other side, we are encroaching on the monopoly of journalism by publishing this information in these analytical reports. Increasingly, I think the CIO will no longer be the chief information officer. I think the CIO will just be doing infrastructure. And that, I think, I ask you, how many of you have chief data officers running your open data projects inside your administrations, or how many of you have looked into that role? And you might want to look into that role because data governance for open data is going to become increasingly important. I know I'm out of time, and you've been very gracious giving me a few extra minutes, so thank you very much. And thank you all for your time today. I've really enjoyed this conference. I think you guys are awesome.